Welcome listeners to the Wild Wild West End, a podcast about Galveston County naturalism and wildlife. This is episode 7, The Frogs of Galveston County. This is my son Hunter, proudly posing with his catch, a green tree frog, Hyla Cenaria. Um, there's actually quite a bit of frog diversity in Galveston County, despite what I thought when I started to make this podcast. I've caught and photographed and observed calls from many of these frogs in Galveston County, most of them. Um, I will start out by saying that one of the few I have not observed is the crawfish frog. I may come back and do an update. Uh, I've once again reached out to Dr. Hibbets for some information about when they might have last been observed and where in the county, but I don't have that information today. So we're gonna move ahead without that and Like I said, I may do an update, but I suspect that they are, in fact, extirpated from the county at this point. So, uh, there were, I guess, 10 genera of frogs in Galveston County, um, Hyla having the most species, uh, Sudacris being uh, close behind that, but there... So there's not as much frog diversity here as there are are some places, uh, even some places that are nearby, such as you know the big thicket area. But but we do have you know, quite a uh, diverse collection of frogs in the county. I have loved catching frogs for my entire life. Um, I remember my father taking me to Rungi Park in Santa Fe, which is in Galveston County, uh, to go out there and catch the tree frogs that weren't as common in my area of Texas City and also um, the Gulf Coast toads that were common out in that area. And there were also American bullfrogs and leopard frogs out there. And, uh, you know, I just am thankful that I had a father that uh, allowed me to do these types of things and didn't keep me pinned up inside. So catching frogs, snakes, lizards, and turtles inside Galveston County, was really a thing that that was uh, formative to me as a child and I try to get my kids out to do the same things my daughter used to love doing it when she was a bit younger but you know she's 11 going on 30 now so she is not as into it but still does go out with us from time to time and, and and have a good time when she does my son on the other hand is absolutely nuts about frogs that's his favorite thing in the world um since you know we're still amidst the COVID-19 um social distancing Um, He is being homeschooled right now. I specifically asked him things that he wanted to be homeschooled about, and he told me turtles, lizards, snakes, and frogs. So I am doing this episode for my son, Hunter, since frogs are his favorite thing. It's going to be quite extensive, so I hope that everyone enjoys it. The Frogs of Galveston County. So the first frog that we're going to talk about is the American green tree frog, Hyla cenaria. Um, Very common frog in Galveston County, probably only slightly less common than the uh, a little bit smaller squirrel tree frog. We'll talk about them next. So the most common color scheme you're going to see on these guys is that, that the big central picture that I have there, that really vibrant green with those big golden eyes and they're going to have a prominent white stripe down their side as you can see in those two side views of the different colorations um that top left hand picture is you know the dark the the darker morph of the frog um that forest green and my caleb paul actually owned one for a while that was uh that was black so i'm assuming that's rarer than the the forest green one but you know it, it does happen um then there on the top right Um, You can see that vibrant, almost yellow uh, coloration, which some of that is is a product of flash photography, but not all of it. Um, My my buddy Kylo Haver sent me a photo of one just the other day that I probably should have used in this presentation, but didn't think about it. That was this, uh, this almost yellow, Um, but but that was actually a squirrel tree frog and and it quickly changed colors. Anyway, um, these guys are nocturnal. You can find them on the sides of homes at night. during the day, you'll find them sleeping, you know, in crevices, beneath vinyl siding. Um, they're common around greenhouses. Um, they can be found hanging underneath uh, palmetto fronds, 
uh, that's a really common place to find them on the west end of Galveston. That's, you know, like the go-to place that I look for them. Um, sometimes you'll find, you know, during the right, <clears throat> the right time of the year when there are many young, you'll sometimes find 20 or 30 of them on the, on the bottom of a, a palmetto frond. So they, they, like I said, they were just a really common frog in the county, common on Galveston Island. I remember as a child, my father taking me over to Rungi Park in Santa Fe to catch these and squirrel tree frogs and Gulf Coast toads. So grew up catching these frogs. Uh, they were, like I said, they were a rare treat where I lived in Texas City where they were not very common. But get outside Texas City into a little bit more wooded areas and, and they become a really common frog. So um, once again, that's the American green tree frog. I'm going to um, I'm going to demonstrate the call for you here. Um, there's some frog chorus going on in this uh, sound clip, but uh, most of what you're going to hear is actually the green tree frog. So they, they have a really distinctive call. Uh, sometimes thousands of them will get going at the same time, you know, around a water hole or, you know, a vernal pool where they're going to be breeding. And it could be just deafening at night. Um, I deal with that a lot when I, I go out looking for road cruising for snakes at night. You know, sometimes I'll sit around and listen to the different frog calls just to try to identify what's out there. And sometimes the sound of the hundreds to thousands of green tree frogs just kind of <laughs> drowns every other frog out but a uh, really neat frog um common in the pet trade um i wouldn't say that i recommend them as pets but they, they do actually make good pets if you if you like display animals they're not a frog that really wants to be handled some tolerate it better than others but um you know it, it's a lot of stress on amphibians the oils in our hands aren't really good for their skin i actually recommend you know wearing um vinyl or nitrile gloves if you're going to handle amphibians um anyway we're going to move on to the next species now so next is probably the most common tree frog in galveston county um really commonly mistaken for the green tree frog mostly because uh they can look almost just like them they're gonna they're gonna lack that strong white stripe down the side um as you can see there on the bottom right um, but also as you can see I've included more photos of this frog than than any other frog in the presentation and that is because they have a really variable appearance and this is key in identifying them from a green tree frog in the case that you find the green specimen um, they can change colors so you know Observe that frog, hold on to that frog, you know, for, you know, a couple of minutes. If it changes colors, you know you've got a squirrel tree frog. It's the only tree frog that is going to dra drastically change its colors like this. Um, you know, they can be tan, spotted. Um, that upper left-hand specimen was, you know, when I had him in hand, he was almost gold. Um, yeah, the, the, the best... I think the defining factor in this in the squirrel tree frog is um, variation in in color and pattern and coloration. Um, they are, in general, much smaller than green tree frogs as adults. The adults are usually about an inch and a half long. Um, you know, you can get them bigger than that. I've occasionally um, found them. You know, probably in, I, I found one that was probably two and a half, three inches one time. Um, anyway, they, they, that's a real monster, though, and that's like your average green tree frog. So, based on size alone, you know, you find a tiny tree frog that's, you know, spotted or dark uh, or, or just not green. It's probably a squirrel tree frog. And then, you know, you have your ones that are green. You don't, in general, get that brilliant green coloration and golden eye color that a green tree frog has. Um, it, they seem to be a little more pale green in my experience with them. I'm sure as variable as they are, though, that you likely will find some that are bright green like green tree frogs. Um, 
These are also nocturnal insectivores like green tree frogs. They're also arboreal. arboreal. You're going to find them on walls of buildings, um, on tree trunks, um, on just like the green tree frogs. A common place to find them is underneath uh, palmetto fronds. Um, but, but one thing I've noticed about squirrel tree frog is they seem to be a little more terrestrial than the greens. Like you can find a green tree frog going across a road just like you can find about anything going across a road. But squirrel tree frogs, on the other hand, you can find them underground in um, water meter boxes, irrigation valve boxes. It's another common place that my son and I will, will actually catch them is inside irrigation boxes. Um, they'll be down there in kind of a mixed group of, of other frogs. You know, um, sometimes you'll find narrow mouth toads down there, sometimes also Rio Grande chirping frogs. Uh, in the same irrigation box with, you know, multiple squirrel tree frogs. So they kind of got their name. I, I, at least I think this is accurate um, because their their call is somewhat like a barking squirrel. Um, I'm going to go ahead and play that, that call for you now. So that was the call of a uh, Hyla squirrella, the squirrel tree frog. And moving on, we're going to go right on to our next Galveston County frog. So the next couple of frogs I want to talk about uh, will round out the genus Hyla in Galveston County. Both of these frogs, the Cope's gray tree frog, Hyla chrysocellus, and the gray tree frog, Hyla versicolor, occur in Galveston County. I have actually not observed either one in Galveston County. I know someone who has um, observed one of the two, but they're not sure which. I have observed these frogs in East Texas in the great, the big thicket, both, and have diagnostic call recordings of them. But they do both exist in Galveston County. So these two frogs bear such amazing physical similarities that the only diagnostic feature that can tell them apart is the call. So if you've seen a gray tree frog in Galveston County, or in most counties they exist in, but have not heard it call, then there is not a definitive answer for which of the two you have seen. Um, these habitually are like other tree frogs. They're a fairly large tree frog, you know, up to two inches, maybe a little larger than that. Um, as I said, habitually, they're the same as the other tree frogs. They like, uh, they're arboreal. They like lots of trees. You're going to find these frogs um, not in the coastal tree mots on the prairie that you will find uh, both green and uh, squirrel tree frogs in. Uh, you will find these guys in more true, uh, you know, pine or deciduous uh, forests of other areas of the county, like Alvin, or, you know, Alvin's technically not all in the county, um, Friendswood, League City, um, Dickinson, that, that, that's a more, those are more likely places you're going to find this frog than, say, you know, Texas City, Lamarck, or Galveston Island. So first I'm going to play you the call of the gray tree frog. Okay, and this next is going to be the Cope's Gray Tree Frog. As you can both see and hear, these are very similar frogs. As I said, that call is the only diagnostic way to tell the difference. And, uh, I'm going to take this opportunity now to tell you about the uh, toxic secretions on the skins of tree frogs. Um, in particular, that of the gray tree frog um, is highly, 
or is, is a severe irritant to, to your eyes if you were to get it in their eyes. I, my first experience with it was a few years ago, and I actually wiped my face after handling some, some gray tree frogs in the big thicket. And my eyes swole up and partially closed for like a good length of time, like four or five hours. So you don't want to get these secretions in your eyes. You want to handle these frogs with gloves to be safe. It, to be clear, it's not going to harm you in any lasting way, but it is a severe eye irritant, and I would imagine that it'd be quite painful to get it in any mucous membrane. So you want to try to avoid that. So that is wrapping up uh, genus Hyla, which has the most um, species in the county. I'm not going to go through the rest of these frogs by genus. Um, we're just going to run through them, and we're going to head on to that now. So this is an introduced frog to the county um, and many, many other places. Eleutherodactylus cystigthenoides, um, also known as the Rio Grande chirping frog, or the Mexican chirping frog, or the lowland chirping frog. Um, these guys are all over Galveston Island and all over the county and many surrounding counties, I'm sure. Um, they are a terrestrial frog. I mean, they can climb to a limited degree. They're not the climber that any of the tree frogs are, though. They, uh, you know, are terrestrial frogs that dwell in leaf litter underneath uh, debris. Um, you can find these guys in flower beds in the yard. Um, you'll find really, really. All right. So to begin with, this is a really small frog, like perch on the tip of your finger, small frog, and you'll find really, really tiny ones that are like so small, they look like like a really small bug. And that is because these frogs, to say they skip their tadpole state or that they don't have a tadpole state wouldn't be 100% correct. But what is true is that they go through their entire tadpole phase inside the egg and emerge from the egg as fully developed tiny frogs, which is pretty cool if you ask me. Um, they're another introduced species that um, we don't really know how much impact they're having. Um, it, it doesn't seem to, you know, there, there seem to be healthy populations of other terrestrial frogs in the same area that these are existing in. I'm sure they are having some impact since they don't really belong here. They actually were imported here in uh, potted plants and soil. Um, and, and I'm assuming that's the same way that they got to all the other places they've been introduced to. Um, very, very similar frog to the greenhouse frog. Um, same genus. And also the, the greenhouse frog has this the same um, reproductive uh, habits where the, the, the tadpole state happens all inside the egg and a tiny frog emerges from the egg. So... Um, they have a really, really subtle call that's often mistaken for a nocturnal bird of some kind. So uh, I'm going to play that for you now. As you can hear there, really, really subtle call. Um, and for years, I thought I was hearing birds when I was wandering around at night. And uh, birds are, you know, some type of chirping insects. But, but then uh, I never connected the dots until uh, I started getting into uh, frog calls. And then I was like, oh, well, that's what all those chirping noises are. Chirping frogs. Makes sense. Um, so... Yeah, you know, they can look a couple of different ways. You'll see in that bottom left hand, uh, you see like the golden colored ones. Those are the ones I see the most often. But, you know, these all these other uh, three photographs here are also, they're all Rio Grande chirping frogs. So they can look quite a bit different, very similar to the greenhouse frog, which they, as they said, as they share the genus with. Um, yeah, pretty cool little frogs. And I am now on to the next one. So next I have for you the greenhouse frog, Eleutherodactylus planorostris. 
Um, this is an invasive frog, um, not one that's having too much impact that we know of, uh, but you know they're originally from uh, uh, the West Indies, Cuba, um, and, and to some other islands. They, they've been introduced uh, in, in many places, including Galveston County. Um, in the old downtown established neighborhoods with lots of big uh, trees, um, these guys can be found in the leaf litter. You can find an occasional greenhouse frog at Lafitte's Cove, which is where this individual was photographed. Um, it's really tough to tell these guys apart from the also uh, introduced Rio Grande chirping frog. You really have to like key these guys out and look at the differences. Um, the one I've noticed is the easiest to find is there's you'll see between the eyes in the main photo not the, the the top photo in the main large photo you can kind of see a black line between this frog's eyes that is um one of the diagnostic features of a greenhouse frog there are others i would have to talk for like 15 minutes about this frog to tell you the subtleties to tell you know greenhouse frogs apart from rio grande chirping frogs to top that off, there are many different morphs of the greenhouse frog and a couple of, you know, variants of the Rio Grande chirping frog. Um, this individual was identified by consensus by some experts on iNaturalists that know way more about um, Eleutherodactylus frogs than I do. So I am trusting their word on that. Um, but I mean, looking at the, the keying this frog out, I, I can actually identify it as a greenhouse frog as well. Both these frogs are the same individual. You can see how small this frog is. It's perched on the tip of one of my fingers there. Um, these are nocturnal frogs. Um, they are perfectly capable of climbing into trees, but they are generally terrestrial frogs that are going to live on the ground in the leaf litter, and they are nocturnal. They have a very subtle call, which... I'm going to play for you now. So their call is also unfortunately quite similar to the Rio Grande chirping frog, but there there are differences. You can tell them apart if you uh, if you really try. But when both of them are calling at the same time in the same area, it, it's a really difficult job to tell them apart. You really have to have these guys the the best way anyways to get them in hand and, and key them out and really just look and and, and see what you got. Um, I like to enlist the help of people on iNaturalist for uh, identifying difficult to identify frogs just so I you know my call is not the final call I like to have a consensus so that was the greenhouse frog on to the next one this is the Gulf Coast toad also sometimes known as the coastal plains toad Encilius nebulifer this is a really common frog in Galveston County. Um, I grew up catching these all around my neighborhood. They were really common in my yard. Um, they were one of the first things that, uh, you know, I ever was able to, to, you know, go flipping, you know, flipping bricks, flipping rocks, flipping boards, and, and you know, finding these and all over Galveston County, but, you know, starting in my own backyard as a young child. They're quite variable, as you can see. This largest photo um that one is really pale in coloration that's kind of an uncommon coloration those uh two bottom left photos are a lot more common that kind of that chocolate brown to black and then that, that very top left photo is a, a a juvenile you know that's a very young frog so these guys are true toads they have really rough skin and it's you know dry um, they, they don't have to live in or near water. They, they, you know, as long as they can get into some moist soil, some leaf litter or something like that, they're going to be fine. Um, they are really, really, um, they eat a lot. Um, the, these, they consume grubs, uh, worms, 
flying insects, um, small snakes. I've e I've seen photos of these these things eating, you know, small fossorial snakes. Even one photo was circulating of one eating a young rattlesnake. Um, they can, you know, if they can fit it in their mouth, they'll, they'll pretty much eat it. Um, I actually have one of these in my uh, educational animal collection. It actually belongs to my son. And it grew from that juvenile size all the way to a full-size toad in, in a year's time. So they mature very quickly and go on to, you know, produce many, many more toads. They have a really stable population here. Has it dropped some since I was young? Yeah, yes, it definitely has. But there's still a lot of these around. I could probably walk out of my yard and catch one right now. Um, they do really good in human air, you know, in, in urban areas. Um, you go out in your driveway and find them. They're actually attracted to light sources, which attract the insects that they feed upon at night. So, it, it, very good pets. Um, but you do want to watch out. They they actually do have two glands uh, there on the sides of their head that uh, you know if they're squeezed, uh, they can produce a toxin, a poison. And, uh, you know, it, it, I'm sure everybody that, that has a dog in Galveston County has had their dog at some point in time um, try to consume a Gulf Coast toad and, you know, then foam at the mouth and act really crazy and have their pupils dilate from that toad toxin. So, you know, that, that definitely happens a lot. So, these guys will create a very loud chorus uh when you know in in their breeding season uh which is you know, from march to september um you can go out at night driving and and just hear a major cacophony uh, of their calls and anywhere near their vernal pools which would be those tire ruts ditches um small ponds and uh that, i'm going to play that call for you now So as you can imagine, if you get, you know, a few hundred thousand of those going at the same time, it can be quite a, uh, pardon my redneck vernacular, quite a racket. So uh, we're going to move on to the next frog now. Uh, did, anyway, th th this is actually one of my favorite frogs. Uh, even as common as they are, uh, I still enjoy going out with my son and my daughter and catching them. So this is a pretty cool frog. Um, I lived most of my life in Galveston County and never found one that I remember as, as a child. Um, I may have and, and just not remembered it. Um, the Eastern Narrowmouth Toad, Gastrophryne carolinensis, which is uh, actually not a true toad. It, it, it's a frog. Um, they kind of got lumped in there with the toads because they're terrestrial. You know, they don't live in or near water, um, require a lot of moisture like many amphibians do. They, uh, they're, they're very fossorial. They live most of their life underground. You can find them in like, you know, meter boxes, irrigation boxes, by flipping over old boards on the ground, those types of things. Uh, they feed on ants and ant larvae, which, you know, I think we can all agree that that's a good thing. Um, they are very small, um, deceptively. As you can see from those pictures there on the left, uh, that top one, that, that's on my fingertip. And that bottom one's just in the palm of my hand. These are really small frogs, like sometimes less than an inch, usually around an inch long. Um, they have semi-rough skin, nothing like a true toad, though. Um, they have quite a toxic mucus. It's not going to hurt you just by handling them. But if you rub that in your eyes or a mucous membrane, um, it is fairly painful. Another frog that has, you know, a similar, I mean, all tree frogs have this same ability, but the gray tree frog seems to be, uh, produce a, a toxin that really hurts when you get it in your eyes. Ask me how I know. So, um, th these are really common in the county, really. Uh, it's, they seem to be more common now than, than ever. I, I, I don't know if that's the case or if it's just because I'm finding them more because I'm out looking. I'm not sure, but me and my son catch these all the time. Um, they, they really only come up from underground in June, and then they, they begin to call, they find a mate, 
they do their thing, they go back underground, and you're not going to see them again until the next, you know, the next summer, unless you're really out looking for them. So uh, they... For such a small frog, which is, this is kind of common, for such a small frog, they have a mighty call, and I'm going to play it for you now. So, I know there's some other frogs calling in the background, including other narrowmouth toads that you can hear in the distance. And then the, the one, you know, that's obviously being recorded is very loud in comparison to those. It's almost kind of shocking in the recording. Um, such a small frog with such a loud call. Um, they are really neat little frogs, and good luck finding them. Uh, they can be difficult to find, but once you find an area that has them, you, you can generally find a lot of them. Next up is the American Bullfrog, Lithobates catispianus. Um, this is a large frog, uh, particularly the adult male, which is the central picture you see there. Uh, that is yours truly, holding a really large American Bullfrog that I caught with my friend and fellow herper, Heath Allred. Um, these are truly apex predators. Sure, there are other, you know, mammalian predators, maybe even uh, birds of prey like great horned owls and things that, that can eat bullfrogs, but they generally will, they, they will eat small birds, they will eat snakes, even large snakes, they will eat all manner of other frogs, in, including bullfrogs, they will eat rodents from small mice to large rats, um, small turtles, uh, they are really voracious predators, they eat a lot. They are tough to keep in captivity because of that. Um, they, they don't make good pets. They're very excitable. Um, that top left photo is the juvenile. And the top right photo over there is... Um, that is a juvenile bullfrog that is just beginning to morph from tadpole to, uh, to frog state. Um, that bottom left photo is another really large male bullfrog that I caught with a uh, friend and fellow herper James Downs. Um, that is him, identifiable by his Texas Coral Snake bracelet that he used to wear. Then the bottom right photo is an adult female, uh, which this is uh, one of the few North American frogs that's actually um, sexually dimorphic, meaning that you can tell visually which is a male and which is a female, at least when they're adults. Um, they are the largest frog in North America. I think I said that already. They, they, they hold the special distinction that they are my son's favorite frog. He recently caught his first large North American bullfrog, as well as a few juveniles, and uh, he had a really great time doing it. So these guys are highly aquatic. They live in or near water. They don't have to be there, but it really is, is the best environment for them is to be in or near water. They're really strong swimmers. They're very strong jumpers. They, I'm, I'm not sure what the max recorded distance on their jump is. I think it's somewhere around eight feet. Those back legs are really powerful and they can jump a long ways. So this, you know, this, this is a really cool frog. I love finding and catching bullfrogs. Um, you can find them in a variety of places freshwater ponds. They don't like brackish water very much, but if it's got really low salinity, you can find them there too. Um, ditches, drainage ditches, um, you know, flooded fields are really good places to find them. And they're easy to find because you can get them with the eye shine at night. You can just shine a flashlight and uh, you will see their eyes reflecting back at you. But just be careful you don't run up and try to catch an alligator because uh, that's happened to me before too. So, these guys live a long time, um, years, um, two to, I, I think it's two to eight years that, that they're said to live, uh, their natural lifespan. I kept on in captivity for a while. Um, he was really large, and I called him the Titan, and he would eat rodents, goldfish, um, 
pretty much whatever I put in there that was that was still alive or appeared to be alive because I moved it around on tongs, he would absolutely go after it and eat it. Um, hard to get them to calm down in captivity. If you catch them wild, I recommend buying a captive bred specimen if you're going to keep one as a pet. Um, plus, they, they, they carry a lot of parasites, so you really don't want to get one from the wild. Um, they have a very distinct call, and I'm going to play that for you now. That sound is really loud when you're out at night. You, I mean, they they are distinct from every other frog in their call. It their their call generally breaks through frog choruses, and uh, it's it's an easy way to locate them too. Um, they're not real easy to catch. You can catch the young ones pretty easy uh, in the road, um, but large, powerful males like that one in the central photo, they they flush really easy, and when they jump they're gone especially if they're near water they'll take a you know five foot leap out into the middle of the water and submerge and you're not going to see them again um and they'll also they have this tactic where they dive to the bottom of the water kick up a bunch of mud in a cloud and shoot out of it um undetected uh, they're very intelligent frogs um another thing i found a very small percentage of them will actually play dead uh, once they're caught uh, and that is to, of course, deter predators. Uh, maybe they'll just drop them, whatever. And, you know, they have the same um, defenses as lots, many, as most, I think, all other frogs, actually, and produce toxins in their skin. Uh, these are just amazing animals. Um, I recommend going out and finding some and checking them out in the wild. They are really neat. Southern leopard frogs, lithobates, sphenocephalus. Are actually really common in the county um, most some areas of the county uh, you know some parts of Texas City I haven't found them in but in uh, you know North Texas City along like Loop 197 um, they are really common they're they're common in most places of the county that, that I've been to you can see them in the roads at night especially on you know rural dirt roads but these are a common frog to even find in your yard I caught my first ones when I was you know 12 13 years old in the northern area of texas city and my son loves catching them i still enjoy catching them although they're a difficult frog to catch uh being a, lith a genus lithobates frog uh you know related to the american bullfrog these guys have quite a powerful jump not like not as far as the american bullfrog but they are they you know they can jump pretty good distance and they share that tactic of leaping into the water and disappearing under a swirl of mud to not be seen again most of the time. Um, they're like most of these frogs, nocturnal, mostly insectivores, though they have been, you know, they're voracious eaters. I would imagine that if there's anything um, that is of a size that they can eat that moves, that they'll probably go after it, attack it, swallow it in the manner that uh, most frogs do with that long sticky tongue. So there's, they do vary some in appearance. They, they, some are dark, some are more of a tan, beige color. Most of them are gonna have some amount of fairly bright green on them. They're gonna have those striped legs like that. Um, they superficially appear similar to uh, American bullfrogs and green frogs, which green frogs actually are not found in the county. Um, they have a very distinct call, which I'm going to play for you now. So that is the uh, distinct call of the southern leopard frog. Doesn't sound a lot like all the other frog calls, but as I've mentioned, you get thousands of frogs calling on the same night. They all tend to kind of blur together and they're tough to pick out of there, but uh, I can usually pick out a southern leopard frog call and even in a frog chorus. So um, that wraps up the southern le leopard frog.
So this really pretty, very tiny chorus frog is the Cajun chorus frog, Sudacris foquetii. Foquedi, um, you'll notice in the pictures there on the right hand side that streaked upper appearance, which they do not all have, but, but most of them do. They, they are slightly variable in appearance. One of the things that you really need to find Cajun chorus frogs are a lot of rain, and flooded areas of tall grass. That's the kind of place they love. You can go out driving around after a good strong rain, probably the day after, and listen for these frogs calling in that tall flooded grass. They're tougher to find, but I actually did manage to find one with my son in Galveston County last year. Uh, so it is possible. We actually found them calling and caught this specimen on the right hand side or the two upper pictures on the right hand side around McFarland Road in Dickinson, Texas. Now the other, the large photo and the lower right hand photo, um, this specimen was actually caught in the big thicket, uh, Ghost Road in Saratoga, Texas. So their call um, can easily be mistaken for calling insects. It's, uh, but I, I'm gonna play that for you now. So these are really neat little frogs, um, tough to find. You need kind of specific conditions to find them, but I, I recommend going out and looking for them. It's, it's both really cool to hear their chorus and to actually see them uh, perched up on that uh, flooded grass calling if you get the opportunity to do that. Um, this, so the chorus frogs used to all be lumped together as, as kind of a single species, but uh, more recently were, were separated by uh, call and uh, habitat and geography. So this is the Cajun chorus frog, which exists in Texas and in Galveston County. So pretty neat little frog, and we are going to move on to the next frog. So another Sudacris or chorus frog that's found in Southeast Texas, specifically can be found in Galveston County. I found in more of the Eastern part of Galveston County, but I'm sure they exist throughout if you found the right location, habitat and conditions to get them calling. This is Sudacris crucifer, the spring peeper. Um, the subspecies of crucifer that exists in this part of Texas is Bartramiyama, so Sudacris crucifer, Bartramiyama, a uh, very similar in habitat and conditions that you're going to find Cajun chorus frogs in, but with a, a different, you know, they do have a markedly different appearance and call. So this one was actually found in the Turkey Creek unit of the Big Thicket by my son Hunter. It's actually the only spring peeper I've ever seen. Um, though there are reports of them in Galveston County, uh, most recently on, from, from last year during the winter on Crystal Beach. So um, for, for some reason, these chorus frogs will not only call in the spring as they're supposed to and are known for, but also will get confused by we think the length of the day in the winter time and begin calling. So that's what happened in Crystal Beach and I went down to look for those frogs and did not find them, though I, I have seen the photo evidence of them. I'm going to play their call for you now. It is uh, different than the Cajun chorus frog in that it's not as easy to mistake for an insect. So here we go. So that single individual calling could be mistaken for a bird fairly easily, I suppose. And this is a recording of a chorus of them calling, you know, hundreds of them at the same time.
I would definitely classify them as a rare frog in the county, or at least rarely found. So, really neat little frog, like a lot of the other ones. Uh, one that my son was absolutely thrilled to catch, and I was thrilled for him because, you know, it was likewise uh, the first time I had seen one. So, all that's left now is for me to find one in the county. So, we are going to move on. I have been catching these small frogs, Blanchard's Cricket Frogs, Acris Blanchardi, in Galveston County for my entire life. Um, I didn't really know what they were. Um, my father actually called these spring peepers mistakenly. Understandably, they do appear pretty similar to spring peepers, but they are not. And they have a very distinct, you know, sort of metallic call that is uh, diagnostic of them. Um, their appearance also, once you become used to looking at frogs, is pretty diagnostic as well. Um, they like streams and freshwater wetlands. I've also found them to be pretty common in really muddy areas with a lot of tire ruts um, that they'll be in those tire ruts. They'll, they'll actually you know, lay their eggs and allow their tadpoles to hatch in those tire ruts. Um, they're going to be, um, of course, you're going to find them out and active at night, but it's real easy to flush them during the day when you're walking in sunny areas with, of a wetland. They'll absolutely be jumping everywhere. My father has a pond up in Centerville, Texas, and there are thousands of them around his pond. And you can find similar places in Galveston County, um, Texas City, Lamarck, uh, Dickinson, all really good places to find Blanchard's Cricket Frogs. Um, a notable thing about them is they have a very short lifespan. It's about one year. Very few Cricket Frogs actually live through two complete breeding seasons. So if they have a really dry, bad year, they're really susceptible to a population, an extreme population drop where only a few individuals may survive um, in, until the, in, into that next year to breed. So they're a really sensitive species because of that. Actually, all frogs are actually are quite sensitive to uh, a bad year or pollution or water quality issues. Um, the Blanchard's cricket frog, much more so than most others. So I am going to play uh, their very distinct call for you now. Uh, you'll, but there's a reason they're called cricket frogs. Um, it is Their calls are quite similar to calling insects, and they're also very small, you know, roughly the size of, a, so let's say, a fall field cricket. So that was, once again, the call of the Blanchard's Cricket Frog. It's also notable that they used to be considered a subspecies of the Northern Cricket Frog, but are a distinct species now, Blanchard's Cricket Frog. A uh, common frog in Galveston County, one that uh, I've been catching for a long time, but kind of dropped off my radar for a number of years because probably from, I want to say from 2000 to 2014, I did not see a single specimen in the county, but then I found some areas that they're really still really common in, probably because they retained water even in those bad years. So this next and final frog is an unwelcome visitor to Galveston County. This is the highly invasive Cuban tree frog, Osteopilus septentrionalis. Um, this is a single specimen, or should I say the single specimen that has been recorded in Galveston County by David Freeman, who was nice enough to allow me to use his photographs for this podcast. In fact, these are the only three photos in the podcast that I didn't personally take because I have not encountered this tree frog in the county. And um, But I am hoping to sort of, I, because I really like frogs, I would really like to um, to, to find one and check it out. I may have found one in Galveston Island State Park uh, last year that I mistook for a really large squirrel tree frog. Um, I briefly detained that frog and kind of looked at it and really didn't know what to look for at the time. Suspected it might be a Cuban, but, you know, can't really collect and take frogs out of the state park. So, you know, I, uh, I just let this frog go. Hopefully I didn't do any damage when I did. I actually think that specimen probably was 
a large squirrel tree frog. I'm hoping it was. So this is definitely a Cuban tree frog that uh, was found by David Freeman in Pirate's Beach on Galveston Island. Um, those large monstrous toe pads on this frog in conjunction with its very large size, it has the distinction of being, uh, even though it's invasive, it is the largest tree frog in North America and it has those very large distinct toe pads. And like all these other frogs, it has a distinct call, which I'll play for you in a moment. These frogs are notable for their voracious appetites, much like the American bullfrog. They will kind of catch and eat whatever they can. And at their size, I would imagine that's quite a few things, probably including small rodents, small lizards, some other small frogs, or I should say smaller frogs because they're not really small. Um, as well as all manner of insects up to probably the largest of moths that most frogs wouldn't be able to get down. So the Cuban tree frog is as neat as I think they are. I, it's kind of terrible that they made it into our county. They've spread uh, from Florida to all, all the way across the south into Louisiana and now into Texas. I would imagine they arrived here by on someone's vehicle or boat to Galveston Island, uh, but I honestly don't know. I know that uh, David Freeman, who caught this specimen, has not seen another one. I have not found one yet, and I've cruised around a little bit trying to hear them call in the area and haven't been successful at that, but uh, here we go. I'm going to go ahead and play their call for you now. So to my ear, these guys actually sound a bit like uh, like the gray tree frog complex, but um, they are, you know, as I said, from a different genus, Osteopilus. So they're originally native to Cuba and the Bahamas and have been spread to many other uh, small islands and the entire um, southeastern, ha uh, you know, portion of the United States. So if they haven't popped up in your area, of Galveston County, I suspect it's probably only a matter of time, unfortunately. So to end uh, this episode of the Wild Wild West End, I'm going to give you a quick book review of um, Texas Amphibians, A Field Guide, which is part of uh, Texas Natural History Guides series. Um, all of these are excellent books. Many Texas Herpers will tell you that Texas Amphibians, A Field Guide is the go-to source to definitively identify the amphibians of Texas. Um, I'm among the people that would tell you that. Um, this is a great book. Uh, one of the contributors to this book was uh, Dr. Toby Hibbets, who contributed uh, some help to my last episode. Um, thanks again for that, Toby. Um, anyway, I just wanted to promote this book. It's excellent. You can get it off Amazon. Um, I recommend getting it if you're going to do any field herping. Um, most of the time, if you're going to restrict yourself to a single county, you can learn to, what the frogs are there. But if you're going to do any kind of travel and go into areas where you're uncertain about what types of frogs are there, go in armed with the, with this book and, and preferably the rest of the series as well. Um, I, I carry the, the, the Texas snakes um, in, in my vehicle with me almost all the time. Um, I don't carry this book with me all the time, but I do own it. And it's, it's a really, to, just to make a really long story short, it, it's a great resource to have. So check it out. Um, you know, it's not a novel you're going to read or anything, but man, it's, it's a really great resource to have. So the wrap up. Um, I've had a lot of fun making this episode. Um, it was challenging, you know, getting all the frog calls, um, digging through my billion photos of frogs that I have to, to you know, try to... Um, put this all together for, for my listeners um, of particular uh, difficulty were, were <laughs> was rather sorting through the photos of Rio Grande chirping frogs and greenhouse frogs and figuring out which was which since I did not have them separated and they are <laughs> really similar frogs. So anyway, that was difficult. Um, just to close it down, um, I'd say that 
you know, frogs are pretty harmless. You, you do want to watch out for their uh, toxic mucus on their skin and not get that in your eyes or mouth um, when you're catching frogs. But it's a great thing to take your kids out uh, to do, to teach them about nature, give them an appreciation for these animals. Um, you know, my son and daughter, at least at one point in her life, my daughter really enjoyed going out and catching frogs with, with her dad. Um, my son still enjoys it. Um, and, and I think she does too every once in a while. It's just not like a everyday type thing anymore for her. She's uh, at the, you know, 11 going on 30. So anyway, uh, that this is her, Angelina, and that's her with a, uh, looks like a green tree frog, though it could possibly with the education I've given you, you could say that, that that could possibly be a green squirrel tree frog, but I believe it's a green tree frog. So anyway, the wrap up. Thanks for listening, everyone. Um, as I said, I've enjoyed making this episode and I'll be coming up with ideas for the next episode. Everyone have a nice night.